Where do I need to be? Here? So good? Yeah, you're good. Excellent. OK, um, this is a bit of a last minute plug in into the program. Um, in the lead up to, to OSTC, we've lost quite a few speakers along the way due to scheduling mishaps and, and of course, in the last number of days, um, of which this talk was a, um, a victim. Um, people having family emergencies. Uh, one person had her back, hurt her back yesterday and is not allowed to fly, you know, that kind of thing. Um, now, tossing people in the morning of the first day um, gets a bit rude on speakers, so um, I decided to uh, fill the slot myself. Um, as one of the sidelines of my company, people have asked me how I set up my company. And as, a, as an effect of that, I set up another website um, and little business, and it's called Upstarta, where I do essentially business consulting or mentoring of other, other businesses. Um, I, don't, I don't want to go into that right now, um, but one of the things that I've had to deal with myself, of course, being an employer and a, and a company owner, is employees and contractors. And what I very quickly found is that what I thought was the case with a contractor being a contractor is not quite the case. So I thought, well, let's run through that. And I've done that with, um, with groups in Brisbane, and that was already pretty insightful where you get into arguments as in, but I thought it was this way. Well, yes, I understand that, but that's not how it actually works. Unfortunately, the ATO would disagree with you, and it won't work that way. So, um, we'll discuss the topics as, as indicated here. Um, <coughs> I didn't realize it's obviously not a defense with, um, with the ATO. So ignorance is not an excuse. That's always the case with the law, but sometimes you can get away with it. The ATO takes a very grim view of this. And the reason for that is that there are so many companies that are actually purposely doing the wrong thing, even though they are aware. So they can't distinguish you, the gullible, ignorant person, from the malicious um, person, so therefore, they are quite cranky about these things now and are actually very, very strict. So, and it has cost some companies hundreds of thousands of dollars in essentially back paying, super back paying work cover and then the fines, obviously. Um, so, um, I will also mention a bit later a tool which you can use on the OTL website. And the cool thing about that is that if you use the tool to decide whether someone is a contractor or not, and the tool says, whatever it does, and you go with that advice, you can make a printout of that and refer to it, and the tool got it wrong, then you're pretty much in the clear. It's then the ATO's problem, not your problem, and you still will have to rectify, but not with, not, um, um, not with hindsight. There's a better term for that. Okay, so first of all, does the worker have an ABN? If the worker does not have an ABN, they're pretty much by definition an employee, yeah? That doesn't mean that if they have an ABN, they are a contractor. It's not that simple, yeah? This is one of the basic checks. So I'm an individual or business or a company. If they're business or a company, they could still be regarded as an employee, okay? Particularly with the business one. Now, who does the work? The example I have for this one is if I get a quote to paint my house, and that painter reckons it's lots more work than he originally thought, and he contracts uh, someone else, he's subcontracting. That's perfectly fine. At that point, they're a contractor for me as well. The moment you can sub, the moment that the person that you uh, contract for the job can subcontract someone else for part or all of the job, at that point, they really are a contractor. Okay, so this applies to, to the person who paints my house and this applies to the plumber. You know, the, I contract a plumber to do a certain job. They really don't have time today, scheduling problem. They let me know, hopefully, but that's just a social practical thing. Um, and they can send someone else who is supposed to be a capable plumber, plumber but again, that is a social practical thing. Um, and someone else can do the job. The agreement between me and my contractor says, I want this fixed, not it will be you doing the job. If, it, if, of course, in IT, it is not quite that simple. Sometimes you, um, well, first of all, you want someone competent 
in that particular job and it can be quite specialized. So the chances of there being another person just handy nearby that can do exactly the same type of job are not absolute. Um, it is not quite as generic as, as the plumbing example. Um, there might also be other factors like NDAs that have been signed and so on. And the other person that could be subcontracted might not be in the know about your systems and so on. So when you um, contact someone and, and then get them to do some work, allowing them to subcontract to someone else is actually prerequisite for them being labeled a contractor. If they are not allowed to subcontract, then they are your employee, whether you like it or not. So this was news for how many people? Hmm. Yes. Are you quickly thinking about, hmm, who did I contract recently where that actually didn't jive? And that'll be quite a few, I would think. So that's the problem. Unless you can, and this is what I found in, in working through the rule set and, and talking with people, this seems to be the one single one, forget all the other rules, this is the one that trips up everybody, particularly in IT, because you tend to not allow people to subcontract. Um, now, some people's contracts with companies do explicitly say that they're not allowed to subcontract. Other people's contracts specifically say that they are allowed to subcontract, and generally that sentence is particularly aimed at solving that particular issue. So if you are yourself a contractor, you might want to see what that, what that contract says. If the contract actually says that, yes, you are a contractor, but um, you're not allowed to subcontract, in that case, you're actually an employee of that company for tax purposes, which means you're actually by law entitled to get super, and the company is obliged to pay that to you, and they have to um, do work cover. So if you're currently dealing with some of that yourself, then that's perfectly fine, but you're doing yourself short. The company that is actually hiring you, or in this case, actually employing you, has to actually deal with those things. If you don't chase it up and the ATO does, then the company will be in deep do -dash. Um Of course, this all gets tricky. You know, you want to work and you don't want to make it too difficult for the company and so on, but you know, it's a fine line on, on how to do the right thing and, and keep everybody out of trouble. But my main, my main aim here is to actually keep employers out of trouble um, because that is, that is what many of us are, are actually trying to deal with. Um, so other factors that I find are less, you know, they're, they're more fuzzy and you can more easily tweak these, these aspects. Um, do you do a quoted price for an agreed or predetermined result or a set amount per period, so like an hourly rate? And depending on those questions, you also get issues with whether someone is actually a contractor or not. Um, if you actually give someone very close direction, um, then they very quickly would be regarded as an employee. If, um, you know, if that person brings their own tools and has their own area of competence and you say, I would like this done and I'm going to pay you this amount of money, um, for this particular task and you come to that agreement, then they're more likely to be regarded as a contractor, at least for those, for those terms. But if you actually closely manage them, then they're an employee, whether you call them that or not. Um, yeah, so the worker would provide you with an invoice. Um, if, they, if they don't, they're pretty much an employee. If they do provide an invoice, then it depends on how it's, how it's phrased and so on. Um, so yeah, when in, in some cases, I haven't seen this personally, but in some cases, an em let's call them an employer for now, might actually do up the invoice on behalf of the employee. And that's where it gets dodgy as well, because essentially you're treating the employee as a contractor even though you're not, you're just shuffling some paperwork back and forth to pretend that he is. Okay, so again, that's one of those, those gray areas, but it tends to end up on the wrong end. So by the time it looks like that, it's an employee. Um, completion of timesheets or attendance records um, tends to make them an employee because that's just not the way it works. Um, if, if they're a contractor, but on an hourly basis, that is perfectly fine then that contractor is responsible for those timesheets. But it depends a little, on how the, a little bit on how that is administratively 
um, organized if the company where the work is done is in charge of that whole timesheet infrastructure and it is required for their business processes, but they're still calling that person an employee, they're on the wrong side, okay? It's very likely to be regarded as an employee. Um, so who provides the equipment? I've already mentioned that. Um, if a contractor provides their own laptop and, and does their work from either their own location or comes in with their own gear, um, basically brings their own toolbox, um, then they're more likely to be a contractor. If all this stuff is provided for them, then they're more likely to be an employee. Makes sense again, yeah? You're providing the whole environment for them and then you're pretending they're actually the plumber coming in with their own toolbox. The toolbox in this case might be in your head because you're in IT, but still, it's... In some cases, you will have to explain this to a non-technical person and they will map it onto the example of a plumber or, or a painter and will probably not work out well for the employer. The liability. Pete. Just on that point, um, doesn't the tax office say something about uh, if you provide a tool which is a laptop, like laptops don't count as tools because everyone's got a mini. A, a more specialised tool than just a computer. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Um, Peter Locke is asking if um, you were to provide a laptop, it's a more specialised tool no, you're saying it's a generic tool that, that everybody has anyway, but there's more specific tooling on that laptop usually. I mean, there could be a whole programming environment that is specific to a task. Um, if again you're providing that, you're not asking the plumber to come in with their own toolbox, you, you're providing that. So an employer can choose to provide an allowance as an extra on top of a salary um, to take care of that kind of stuff for an employee. So they can provide an employee with, a, with um, either a laptop or an allowance um, on top of their salary to take care of the laptop themselves and then it becomes their responsibility to maintain. But because it is used for their specific job, it is actually provided for by the, um, by the employing company. So that's just an extra on top of a salary which is um, listed in, in the employment standards and, and professional um, awards, which I'll, I'll mention in a bit. So I don't think the laptop thing is a very viable one because again, you'll generally be discussing this with non-techies and yeah, I haven't seen, let me put it this way, I haven't seen any, any writing on the ATO site that appears to indicate that laptops are seen as particularly different from other tools. Have you or? Okay. That would be great. Okay. Um, so, yes, we got interrupted here. So, who is liable for the cost of rectifying any defect in the in the work performed? If the contractor is is entirely responsible, um, for instance, we we recently had our deck painted. Some of the paint didn't quite stick, and it had to be you know bubbled bubbled in the sun, and some bits had to be redone. You know, that's just a part of doing that particular job. The contractor was entirely responsible for that. They provided a quote for doing the job to a certain quality. It didn't quite work out that way. Well, we both knew that could happen. So I gave him a phone call. He came by, fixed it, and, and scooted off again. Um, he wouldn't get paid extra for that work unless it was otherwise agreed. So that's clearly a case of it being a contractor. If, um, if however, you ask someone to rectify stuff because it's not quite as you liked it and you, you pay them extra, then you're more likely to be regarded as an employer because it, it, you take it on as your problem with that person only doing some work. Who has the responsibility? Well, apparently it's you, not the person you regard as a contractor, and therefore they are an employee. Does that make sense? So again, you're acting directly as a manager with an employee rather than as a contractor relationship. So you've, you've changed the relationship in such a way that would, regard, that would make them an, um, an employee. So, as I mentioned, the safe approach, or at least your, your get out of jail free card, let's call it that, is using that tool, and I would highly recommend that you do that. Um, essentially, you will come to about the same outcomes as what I just mentioned, because I've just derived my, um, my questions from what's done here. And the way I've done that is play, play this form and just go back, change some things, and see how it works out. And that's how I worked out that the subcontracting thing was actually the key in flipping it for most people's situations. 
So use that one. The slides will be available um, as well, of course, as well as being on the video. Um, and if you go to the ATO and, and look up ATO employee contractor, you will find this tool very quickly. Um, so this is, the, this is the overview of what I've mentioned. And as you can tell, the highlighted one is really, really the one that tends to, that tends to catch people out. Um, so my, my main business is, well, I run an IT, IT company, um, hosted, um, we, we do managed services for hosting and, and database administration and so on. It is highly specialized. It makes absolutely no sense for us to allow a contractor to subcontract. It makes absolutely no sense. There's an issue of, you know, being able to communicate easily with the, with the other um, engineers. Um, there's issues of trust, NDAs with clients and, and so on. And it just wouldn't work to subcontract. So um, we have employees and we have a company which has a contract with us and that company has employees that does the work. So in that case, it is okay because it is a propriety limited company and then that propriety limited company has the responsibility for their own employees. So if you're dealing with a contractor who has their own propriety limited that then contracts to you, yes, from your perspective, all would be well and they would be regarded as a contractor from the purposes of, of your company. However, that employee has a, or that contractor has a potential problem because if the tasks that they do and the way it's arranged inside their own company and the number of hours they spend relative to other work and so on um, is such that is regarded as, um, what, what was it, Pete? Was it professional services, personal services? Well, personal services? Personal services income. If it is regarded as personal services income, there's different situations again, but it's slightly out of scope for this. But the point is, you could hide yourself from the problem by having your contractor run a propriety limited, but that just puts the entire problem on the contractor and they will still have to solve it. it the, the construct that is made there is specifically aimed at someone discouraging um, someone who would otherwise be an employee from starting a propriety limited to evade that particular um, scenario. The, if the intention is to avoid being an employee, then the ATO rules make it very difficult to do so. If you just work for a single company under specific conditions, you are an employee anyway, or you will have all the responsibilities that you would have anyway. There's no advantage to actually doing that. It might actually be more expensive because of the overheads that the propriety limited introduces. If however, you do half of your work for one company and half of your work for another company, then it can make perfect sense to have a propriety limited on top of that as a company structure, but you could also run the same thing in a business and it would still be fine. So the difference between a business and a company is a company, at least in Australian terminology, is a propriety limited company. It's a separate legal entity and a business is an individual with an ABN and a tax file, their own tax file number. So then the legal entity of that person is the same as the business person. With a propriety limited, it's a separate legal entity that has owners and, and shareholders, maybe, okay? So, should someone be an employee, then that is what you actually need to take care of. Um, so there's pay-as-you-go withholding. So rather than um, you as a contractor filing your tax return and just adding your, um, your income in there and your expenses and so on and doing, doing a bit of extra bookkeeping, um, what the employer needs to do is actually withhold the appropriate tax to begin with. And um, then you in your tax return, you, you will get from your employer a, um, an annual statement. And that's the information you provide to the tax office. You might still get some money back or pay some extra or whatever else has been going on. But the basis is that the employer withholds that tax. So your pay at that point becomes net pay rather than the gross pay, okay? Um, the employer is required to pay super. And the super um, is set at a minimum um, that is called the compulsory super contribution. And at the moment, what was it like? Nine and a half. Nine and a half, it went up, didn't it? So last year it was nine and a quarter. And 
um, this, this financial year it's nine and a half percent super. Um, so can you, can you offer an employee more? Absolutely. Um, can you offer them less? Absolutely not. It's not going to fly, don't go there. Um, not even with this government, <laughs> really. Um, this government has shifted around the rate at which that compulsory super is going to increase. So as I mentioned last year, it was a little bit less and it's increasing. So the, the schedule of increase has been shifted around a little bit. I looked at the table that actually showed the differences. There's not a heck of a lot of difference. It really doesn't matter much. It is, you know, kind to be seen to be doing something, but it doesn't actually change anything fundamentally. It also, speaking as an employer here, I don't really care about that that much. You know, there are bigger issues than that. And personally, I have to say that what the current government is doing is causing me more hassle that, than what they say they're trying to solve. Um, you know, so I'm not too impressed with that one. Uh, French benefits tax. Yeah, be a bit careful with giving things to your employee that are specifically aimed at avoiding sticking it on the pay slip. Does that make sense? So if you, this, this is a famous example, probably. <laughs> it will happen to quite a few people. If you pay for the person's air travel, but they get to keep the frequent flyers, then the frequent flyers are actually fringe income. It is effectively income and it has to be, it should be declared. Uh, for instance, Qantas has some trickery on their website when you look at your, at your frequent flyer points to actually get a statement out of there, which kind of helps you declare it and calculate what the actual value would be. So is that freebie, you know, if you've flown, if you've had to fly to Europe and back, you get a free flight from Brisbane to Sydney out of that pretty much. Now that is no longer a free flight. It is actually part of your taxable income. So if you declare it, that's okay. If you don't declare it, the tax office probably knows anyway, and at some point they'll blat you over the head. It just depends on what their focus is for this year. Um, I'm not aware of them being particularly interested in, in that kind of um, issues this year, but deductions that are not supposed to be there um, and this kind of thing, it's kind of on the same line. And the tax office tends to pick a couple of categories every tax year to really, really look, look out for. So um, yeah, be aware of that. Then there's occupational health and safety, and I'll get back to that in a moment. I'll briefly jump back to more detailed pay as you go. Um, so you have your main wages, the conditions under which you pay those wages, um, the award that is connected to that, um, and you will always pretty much fall under a award. Um, it's just a matter of figuring out which one, and that can get really, really finicky depending on who you call, how you ask the question, you may actually get a different answer. There's also online tools, and they're exceedingly useless, particularly when we're in IT. We can, get that, we can end up in very curious awards. So I can shortcut this for you. Um, I know which awards we are probably all under. Um, and leave entitlements. When someone is an employee, they are, and they are entitled to a minimum number of days leave per year. And then if they are part-time, that is pro rata and, and so on. Um, and you need to register for pay as you go. Well, that's all fairly simple. So here are the two that are actually probably going to be relevant for you. One is the professional employees. So that's the, the MA, lots of zeros, 65. Um, so my employees are mostly professional employees. So they're engineers and consultants and trainers and so on, and that just falls under there in IT. You could stick them under a couple of other ones, but it gets really, really quirky and dodgy, and it doesn't really help in terms of fitting it anywhere. That's the best fit. And we have derived that from various people with their own phrasing, calling Fair Work Australia and actually asking the questions. And at some point we had some reasonable answer that got to that. Um, then the clerk's private sector would be any admin people that you employ. So those are the two that Open Query has. Uh, you can check on fairwork.gov.au in online tools or, or ask. It's a huge list and there's also legacy, um, legacy awards and it's a giant mess. It's not easy to wade through. So see if that one fits and it usually does. Otherwise, um, good luck. Super, so 9.25, that's the old one. I should have changed that, so it's nine and a half now. Um, the employee will need to fill out a form for you um, that you can just neatly file and stick in your admin. 
um, where they nominate which super fund they want their, their money to go. Um, if you do the reading on this, it kind of, the award seems to indicate that certain, certain professions have a limited set of possibilities of super that you can choose from. That is not actually the way it practically works out. You just do have a choice of super. So whatever super fund the person arrives with is the one you can write down and that is perfectly fine. You can toss the money in there. Okay. It has to be paid at least quarterly. Um, what my company does is when we pay our employees, um, we have a separate bank account um, that, that gathers some interest along the way, but that's not really the point. We have a separate bank account. So when we pay the employee their net salary, we also put some money into the super account and we also put some money into the pay-as-you-go account. So when we have to pay either the super or the pay-as-you-go, we just have that money. It is not part of the general pool of money that flies around. So you should never end up in cash flow problems. My company specifically tries to get out, well, stay clear of that kind of stuff. We try to never spend money that we don't yet have. Okay? It's just a, that's a bookkeeping habit or business running habit. Um, the government offers an aggregation portal for super payments and they actually insist that you use it now. It used to be a recommendation and hmm, here's this cool tool and it was actually really, really useful and they kind of insist on it now. Um, um, it's the government super clearing house or something. It's a hideous acronym. It's very difficult to find online. But um, what it comes down to, you log in as an employer, you say which employees you have, and then when you have your, um, when you need to make the super payments, you look up in your own bookkeep bookkeeping software what those payments should be. You fill in those magic numbers for each of the employee. It adds up to the same total that you had, and um, then you transfer um, using the appropriate BPay code into the clearinghouse, and the clearinghouse actually takes care to um, transfer the appropriate amount of money to each of the supers. So it's actually beneficial for an employer because they only need to fill out one page on the website, do one BPay payment, and then if you had 20 employees with 20 different supers, you've only had to do that once. Okay? So there's actually a benefit to it. They, that is actually a reduction in, in FAS. And uh, the previous Labour government actually put that in place, as far as I can tell. So it's been in there for a couple of years, and it's now just, um, it, it's getting used properly. Where cover? Gets a bit more murky. It's organized per state. So for if you have employees in, who work in multiple locations, you either have branches or you have people working from home, the location where they do the work mostly is where they're based. So Open Query has employees and contractors in, in Brisbane, so that's Queensland. We have people in, in, in New South Wales and we have people in Canberra, so I deal with work cover in three different states. Lots of fun. Um, for each state there are a couple, of, um, a couple of different providers, so then you can ask quotes from those individual insurance providers, but you first need to start with the site that gives the overall information for that state, and then you see which other providers there are, and then you can get quotes. And they're usually fairly similar, so th there's not an awful lot of um, money in it, actually trying to get quotes from different providers. That doesn't seem, in theory, there's competition, and it doesn't actually do much, by my reckoning at least. Um, so you need to apply with each individual provider for each individual state. So um, if it's one provider in one state, and it's the same provider in the other state, you still need to get two quotes, because they pretend to be separate for that state. So this is a bit annoying administratively. The premium is, ba is based of an estimate of the wages. And of course, that will get sorted out at the end of the year when you actually put in a report. You have to file it somewhere between the end of June and, 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 and um, end of July or mid-August or something. You have to be fairly, fairly spot on with that. Um, so those actual wages then get, get worked in and you might get some premium back or, or whatever, or you might need to pay a little bit extra and then that is the estimate for next year unless you provide a separate estimate again. Um, I found that Googling work cover with a particular state acronym tends to get you to the right starting site and then from there you contact all the, all the insurance companies. But the most important thing is talk to each insurance company for the separate state that you're actually dealing with because otherwise people will get terribly confused. You can't talk to the New South Wales phone number necessarily to talk about Queensland, even though it's the same insurance company. It, uh, it will get you the wrong quote for the wrong state and then fall under the wrong rules and it's silly buggers. Okay, incorporation, I already mentioned this. Um, 
I've been both a business as well as a company. I actually found that being a company is not that much fuss. You need to organize it properly. Have a good accountant. Have a really, really good accountant. Um, I actually had to ditch mine at some point and um, have a better one now. And my goodness, that helps. So they help you make sure that the filings to, to ASIC are actually done appropriately and at the right time and so on. They, they will keep an eye on that. They cost a few hundred dollars a year, but their fee is actually minute to the, to, to the couple of hundred dollars that you fee to, to ASIC. So it's actually worthwhile. Accounting. I actually use Xero. And Xero actually does all the calculations for me for pay-as-you-go and, and the super and all that kind of stuff. It's actually quite convenient. It has an op option to actually talk directly to the tax office, which is free, to, to report things like a new employee. It also has facilities to deal with the whole super thing for you. We, that does cost extra, and we don't use it anymore because there is that clearinghouse. Um, so... Xero already built in a facility, so you could actually press one button and do all the super for all the different super funds that, that your employees might have. I thought, well, what's the benefit? One B pay and we're done based on the same information. Okay, quick questions, about one minute, and then I'll let the next speaker speak. Yo. What would you do to the overhead of uh, having a contractor versus having an employee? What, what are your sort of percentage of the wage? Is that what you guys use for? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll repeat the question. The, the question is, um, what is my perception of the difference in, in cost and, and administrative overheads of a contractor versus an employee? Um, depends on how you calculate things. And it, that, that is a, an aspect of what your employee actually expects or wants or insists on. Because in some cases, either an employee or contractor can be really slack with their entitlements, or they can be really strict with their entitlements. But is that really something you want to be wading through as an employer? I'd like to do the right thing. And sometimes it's a little bit annoying <laughs> this week, but I want to do the right thing anyway. And the main issue is actually that in many cases you do not have a choice. And that's what I'm more, more getting at in this, in this talk. You do not actually have a choice. So you choosing if you reckon that possibly contractor was lower overhead than uh, uh, having that employee, you getting blatted over the head by the ATO and charged with a couple of hundred thousand dollars of back pay is more inconvenient for your company and may put you out of business. Because if you haven't taken that into account, you will probably not have the money, which means you're bust. Okay? So I just don't go there. That's why I sorted it out, and I'm recommending that you do it too. Um, so yes, in the past, I had, I had contractors that could possibly be regarded as employees, and I just took action once I found out about that to actually make sure they were employees, because that was the right thing to do. I wasn't aware before, but, you know, as I said at the start, unawareness does not make you innocent. So, okay. I hope that answers the question sufficiently. Um, I think it mainly depends on the, on the benefits that you give your your employees. So if you pay them a little bit extra to take into account that they need to pay their own super, it pretty much evens out anyway. You know, the cost of having an employee in terms of admin overhead depends on what tool you use. I found that's why I'm mentioning Xero because it's actually done really well, even though it's a cloud-based thing and I don't quite control my own data there. I can get it out, but I have to rely on that service working. But it, they're doing really well. It's a New Zealand company. They've been around for a number of years and they deal really well with the Australian tax system as well. It's, it's really, really pretty nice. And their, their support is fairly responsive. So I'm quite happy to, to mention that. Okay? Not open source, though, I'm afraid. That's the way it is. Okay. Thanks, all.